Hi, this is Ibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I'm also the host of Moms Don't Have Time to Lose Weight, and I'm the editor of the anthology, which you should run out and buy, called Moms Don't Have Time to, a quarantine anthology. All proceeds of that book go to COVID-19 vaccine research. And I'm the editor-in-chief of Moms Don't Have Time to Write, a new publication on Medium, and we're accepting submissions, so please send your personal essays there. And if all that isn't enough, you can follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens, and my website is zibbyowens.com. Okay, now back to this amazing podcast. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss Good Neighbors. Thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. And congratulations on this being a Barnes & Noble book club pick. I know you're excited for your uh, event with Jillian Flynn. That's so exciting. I'm I'm really excited. It's uh, it feels unreal. Like I think I'll believe it happened like a year from now. It's all on Zoom. <laughs> you know. I know. It's like things on Zoom. It could be a deep fake. <laughs> yeah. Do they really happen or not? I don't know. Yeah. Right? It's like nothing in real life seems to be actually happening um this virtual reality world we live in but anyway um but it did happen that you got picked for Barnes and Noble so what was that like were you super excited to find that out yeah yeah and I was you know like my heart started pounding and everything and then I thought well is it it's the same thing really like <laughs> because we're all home you know it's just the only way we're hearing about the world outside is through email <laughs> So it's like, how do we know they're not going to change their mind? (laughs) (laughs) So, so it was really exciting. And then when the book came out, um, because it was a book club selection, they had it on front tables or at least tables in all of their stores in California. So I COVID safe visited 44 stores. No. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yeah, wow. I'll do more. But like I walk in and I have my own pen and I have two masks and I just like talk to them and now they know I'm coming <laughs> to so many and they just have me sign and they take a picture and then, and then I give one of my books to because I have stock to one of the managers um, and it's fun and it feels like real. So I, I'm really glad I did it first off because I got to meet so many people and I never have that opportunity you know, it's unusual for a book to be selected by Barnes and Noble and in their front stores. So I wanted to capitalize on that and enjoy it, but also it just made it feel really real. So I was glad to do it. That's awesome. The Barnes and Noble closest to us here on the Upper East Side went out of business and it was like a multi-floor emporium. And I used to go all the time and I would let my older kids like go run around and then like go pick them up an hour later. And now it's gone. It's so sad, but anyway, um, I'll get down to Union Square or something and go check out your book in, <laughs> on the shelf. Um, so let's talk about your book, Good Neighbors. Ironic title since, you know, are they really good neighbors? Not so much. Yeah. Um, so I love that you have this combination of a background in toxicology and also creative writing. And you use all of that to like have this big sinkhole happen and ooze out from the sidewalk and like capture a dog and all the stuff that happens in this neighborhood and yet you put it in this like literary fiction type of story it's like the perfect blending of all of your stuff so tell me about how tell me about the um the impetus and how you decided to write this book so I I tend to write start things and I and it by the seat of my pants and I just go in and I don't know what I'm gonna do and usually I have like 30 different ideas and 100 different characters and I know that there's something, I know there's some best iteration. And this is my fifth novel, my fourth, fourth that's been published. And I feel like I got it right this time. <laughs> yeah, don't always, <laughs> where it's like, yes, they all came together and they all fit in a way that was right. And that what I was trying to do. And that sort of started from the subconscious and then made its way into something that really was cohesive. Um, I started a long time ago and I was working in, I, I, my first three books were horror. And so I was just writing another horror novel, which is, I don't mean just as, you know, a feat. Um, but the, the narrative I couldn't make work because, um, 
the story was too human and the, there was a conflict. I kept trying to bring a monster out because I know how to do that. And I know, you know, it's like you've done it before. So, and it just, the, the character's personal stories were so much more important than any monster that it just, the monster every time felt wrong. So I put the book aside and then I kind of realized um, years later, after I wrote another book in between, uh, that I didn't, need, I shouldn't write horror. And I was like, this is terrifying, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, you know, like Raymond Chandler says, like when he gets stuck, he always has a character walking with a gun, you know, and then you keep moving. And I was like, what do I do? And I can't have a character walking with a gun. So I really had to, had to learn how to not write horror, which was fun. It was hard, it was fun. The irony, and so the scariest story ends up being uh, the writing of the book itself. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> anyway, sorry, go on. Well, so I, once I disposed of the idea of a monster, I had to think about what are, how do personal relationships work? How do I really talk about mob mentality? So I studied Kitty Genovese, oh, yeah. um, that story of how this woman in the 1970s was supposedly murdered outside of her apartment building in Queens. And it was used as a justification for uh, people to flee the city. Um, and it was a really popular myth because I think it made people feel okay about white flight. Um, and I think that's why it got its traction. So there's so much going on, but on top of that, the story is false. Um, she didn't die alone. The neighbors did call the police. When they saw that she was struggling, one of them came out and held her as she died. But for whatever reason, even in sociology classes, until 10 years ago, it was taught that people are bad and they do these bad things. And uh, there's this bystander effect and no one helps each other. So I was really surprised, um, you know, that, that it wasn't true. And then I looked at the Stanford prison experiment, which I was taught in college. And that experiment is about how if you have guards and prisoners and they're just students, but you tell them to take these roles that one will become more masochistic and one will become more sadist, sadistic and they fill the roles they're told to fill. Um, and we're taught that in sociology class. And that too is a lie. Um, that experiment was debunked. The guy who ran it um, stopped it because not actually because everyone was being masochistic and sadistic, but because it was a false experiment, because everyone around him, they were his students, they knew what they wanted him, what he wanted from them, they were providing it to them, and they were just being nice, and they weren't taking it as seriously as he pretended, or as that footage shows. It was just, it was popular, because people like telling scary stories about what people are really like. So then I was like, so, so people are good, you know, <laughs> but I want to tell the story about what's happening right now in the world. Like this, this Trump, uh, Republican, Democrat, polarized um, nation. We're so fractured and we're so, because of social network. So then I started st studying the social network. This is long. And the social network I realized was like, was something that was hijacking our best in instincts and making us more radical in ways that we wouldn't ordinarily be. And I thought that's, maybe that explains more of this than this humans are inherently bad, but that sort of we've been captured by this, this system where we're told that we are morally obliged to constantly state our opinions about things that we don't even know everything about. And then if we don't state our opinions that we're failing people and people are being hurt and people are dying and our only agency is to talk and to rile each other up. Um, and I think the inevitable end to that was the capital. Um, so then I, that's where I really sort of, sort of got steam. And then I also had to think, well, who would be the leader the ringleader of something like this. And I started studied narcissism and narcissistic personality disorder. And uh, Rhea Schroeder um, 
is clearly a narcissist. And I was like, oh, this is perfect because they can, um, they're the only sane people who are so attached to their facade that if anyone were to threaten it, they would be driven to murder. So, so it all worked together. And I think like the story isn't about people are bad. The story is really about, this is the way people who are good could be hijacked. And even a narcissist is a good person. And this is, you know, it's a cautionary tale, but it's also about the people who avoid that hijacking were the kids. So. Wow. Lots to discuss in there. (laughs) First of all, I was a psychology major and I feel like um, this interview has now justified my entire college education because you've referenced things from so many different classes. Um, And I'm so glad I still remember what they were. So yes, I'm like, oh, Kitty Genevieve. I did that in social psych. Anyway. um, And also narcissism. I mean, yes, I am well acquainted with some narcissists and I'm very familiar with that personality type. And I think that the way you portrayed Rhea was so though um, uh, sympathetic, to be honest, because you explain her loss and her close relationship with her dad and the loss of that and what made her sort of get adrift, right? Everything. So you paint her in a picture where you understand like, oh yeah, you can see how someone would, would have trouble which I think is what you're trying to say about narcissists, right? That like it comes, doesn't necessarily come from a bad place. It's maybe bad things make you a narcissist. I don't know. I No, I, I think that every bad behavior can be attributed to people fighting with ghosts. You know, they're, they're really not trying to, to, to hurt you. They're seeing something, they're seeing a threat that's not there from their past. And they're just, it's some defense mechanism kicking in. And those people are in real pain, which is like, since I've been thinking about that, it's so much easier to get along with people who are troublesome. <laughs> <It's because laughs> I realize, oh my God, you're, you're in fight or flight right now. You're freaking out. You think that I'm doing something to you and I'm not, you know, or you think, and it's, it's really the, I think recognizing that people are in pain and that people who misbehave are in pain, it's not it doesn't forgive them of their behavior, but it makes it so much more understandable. And it makes it much easier to diffuse because you don't have to come back and say, no, no, I, you know, you can just move on. You know, (laughs) I think that's the best way to handle that. Let's not talk about the subject that triggers you, you know? So just not engage, right? Just like. Yeah. I mean, I think there's so many other, when you see someone uh, freak out like that, you're not going to get through what they're seeing is so scary. You can't get through to that. You just have to find another way. And in all your research, is there anything you found that can stop the ghosts? I think adulthood. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think maturity and being surrounded by people who listen um, and finding people in your life that, uh, that listen so that you're not so scared. But I think also uh, Rhea is trying to cure herself Mm -hmm. at the start of this because she knows something's wrong, but she's so deeply uh, entwined in the mask that she's created for herself that she's, you know, it's, it's, it's a, uh, it's a dual reality for her. Have you, have you seen the movie Bad Moms? Have, have yes. you seen Bad Moms? So, you know, um, I recently rewatched this when I was in bed with COVID for nine days. <laughs> I could finally watch some movies. Um, anyway, the Christina Applegate character, who's like the terror of the PTA, in the end, you find out that like really, you know, her husband is in, insider trading and she's lost everything and, you know, her life's a mess. So then you look back and you're like, oh, that's the way, that's why she is the way she is. And I thought of Rhea who like, becomes the whole organizer of the neighborhood and <clears throat> all the things that she does. And it seemed kind of similar to me in a way. <clears throat> it's a super effective defense mechanism to, to take a power position so that no one else can judge you. It's like, it's, it, you're the least vulnerable person in the room. <laughs> you know, it's exactly what a narcissist would do. Wow. 
I feel like I need to read your textbook on narcissism. I feel like we need to have an <laughs> offline discussion. <laughs> this is like, you have some sort of inside scoop into this whole thing. So um, pretty awesome. <laughs> um, there was one passage I wanted to read, uh, if you don't mind. If yeah. I can find it. Um, and this is, you know, well, this is, um, well, here, I'll just start reading. The first 10 years, it was so lonely. Well, this is, I'm debating where I should start it in her pre Fritz life and blah, blah, blah. Um, well, I'll just start here. Um, it was all surface, no laughs, no confidences, no companionship. It was so lonely. The first 10 years, she cried a lot, but she kept it a secret, a hidden shame because she was sure that her lackluster marriage was evidence of her own inadequacy. If she confessed her loneliness to Fritz, he'd know the truth, that she was messed up. He'd divorce her. His lawyer would unearth the accident. Everyone would know why she'd been fired from UW. All of Maple Street. They'd look at her and see right through her. They'd know everything. Unthinkable. And so she dried her eyes. She buried her loneliness so deeply that she lost the knowledge of it. She stopped seeing it. That was so great. Oh, I'm glad we're talking about it. I was like, is narcissist the wrong direction to take this? But you, yeah, <laughs> you are a psychology major. That is, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's like, sometimes you can just deny something enough that it becomes your truth, right? And then all of a sudden, Rhea not only has all this, but it's like, then she's carrying around secrets. And of course, the corrosive power of secrets is like the worst. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think she feels like she's rotten. Mm -hmm. Like she's the worst, most horrible, disgusting, non-human. And like, she just needs to keep it together for people not to find that out. Yep. Because if they do, her world's going to fall apart. No one will love her. And like, that's, it's the funny thing about any kind of um, coping mechanism that you create, which is that everybody sees you. <laughs> like, like, you didn't realize it, but they know exactly who you are. They see your flaws completely. It's, um, it's sad for that reason. Because I think, you know, her family knows exactly who she is. Wow. Well, and then of course we have, <laughs> then we have, you know, the other couple um, who now I'm forgetting everybody's name. The uh, Wilds. The Wilds, thank you. Um, and how like misfit they feel in the entire community and how, you know, someone can be like a beauty queen, but yet is signaling all the wrong things to their community and feeling constantly excluded and, um, you know, has to rely almost on the kids to like get invited to a party or whatever. So um, I feel like there are neighbors who are discriminated against by how they look. And, you know, interestingly, this is not about race. This is about just one person looking different and acting different. And like the man with all the tattoos on his front porch smoking and um, versus, you know, all the like preppy people going off on their lives and how it feels to be different. So I don't know, talk a little bit about how you made that family like a central feature and just so other. Well, I grew up in like a conservative Long Island town on Long Island and it was mostly Republican. And like the thing that the kids wore were, were like polo shirts and, Etc. cetera. And uh, you, you just reminded me of like my really good friend in high school when I would go to pick her up. Like we couldn't honk, we had to go to the door or her dad would come out furious because that wasn't what ladies were supposed to do, you know? And like, she always had to wear a belt and she was never allowed to wear jeans, you know? And I can't imagine if like somebody with tattoos was smoking on the front stoop. And it's like, you could smoke, you, could, you had to smoke in secret someplace. And you could drink a lot, but you had to do it somewhere <laughs> in a way that was not noticeable. You couldn't get loud drunk. Um, so I think there's all these rules that particularly come with uh, people aspiring for upper, upper middle class. And they wanna signal that and they want their children to, uh, to follow those rules because they know it's true, their kids are gonna do better if their kids are act like that. Um, so I think walking into that and thinking like, I want a piece of this. I want a piece of the American dream. I haven't had it easy. I want my kids to have it easier. I'm gonna figure this out. 
um, I think is much easier said than done if you have no experience with what the middle class looks like, with what a nuclear family looks like. Because a nuclear family is like a mystery in its own. Um, so I think there wasn't much that, you know, I, I exaggerated it. You know, she's a former beauty queen and she comes off cold because she's so frightened of everyone that she's just constantly stiffly smiling and trying to do everything right. Meanwhile, she's got like, you know, tube tops on and like, you know, suburban moms do not have bodies for tube tops and it's insulting to them. They don't like it. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like an affront. Um, and she's pregnant, right? Yeah, and she's pregnant. Oh yeah. Even worse. Yeah. I mean, come on. Yeah. Well, she could get away with that. You know? <laughs> I know she can, but I'm pregnant. sure everybody else would be annoyed, right? Yeah. Like her pregnant looks better. Look, she looks better pregnant than I look normally. Like that kind of thing. Yeah. They're I'm all in like, I'm wearing Lululemon pants right now. So I can say they're all in like Lululemon, <laughs> like blousey. And um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, and they've got the accents, but what also, you know, if you were to ask them, what have you read lately? They'd be like, well, I read this self-help book about the secrets of the rich. <laughs> Everyone would be like, what? You know? <laughs> um, so they just don't fit. And uh, they're kind of, uh, what's worse is, is you kind of depend on word of mouth uh, in most jobs and, and connections. And she's a real estate broker and he's a salesman. And they're thinking they're going to get more commissions. And in fact, they get less when they move to this wealthy neighborhood because nobody thinks they would be competent enough to do any kind of work for them or to, to, to be vouched for. So it's, it's, it's a disaster. And um, I think it would be a disaster for anyone trying to uh, hold on to the American dream and move into uh, and go upwardly mobile. It's really hard. And I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, and then what happens is uh, they're befriended by the queen bee who's next door, who's like, they're actually refreshing and I kind of hate my life. And I would like something interesting to happen. And I'd like to meet some interesting new people. So it starts with that. And then what happens is um, there's a misunderstanding between the moms, between the queen bee and between Gertie. And they don't, they read each other wrong. And it hits both of their defenses in such a way that they're both terrified. And it's a disaster. And suddenly the whole block turns against the wild family, just as a sinkhole opens and one of the children falls inside. And then they begin to think maybe the wilds had something to do with this. Maybe the wilds are responsible for this injured child. Look at them, they're so weird they would have to be the ones to blame. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Um, well, somehow like we've just talked for so long and I feel like we're just getting going here. Tell me like what else you have coming next. Do you have other monsters coming out again in the next one or are we delving more deeply into sort of psychological narratives or what's next? I think it's more psychological. So the next one, um, Simon & Schuster has it and or a partial of it and they seem to like it. So I think it'll move forward. And um, not horror, but I like, I like community, uh, the ways the community works. And I like the ways, I like using towns and, and blocks as metaphors for America. And I think these American stories, um, I like telling and I like learning um, and trying to make sense of the world in ways in that way. And I, and I feel like I can do it. So maybe it's my job to do it because I feel like there's so much fracture going on in this country and it's so hard to make sense. So, so the, next, the next book is about a town, you know, as opposed to a block. And, uh, and probably that's as much as I can say. Um, the last most, recent publications I've had are The Night Nurse, which was published in Best Horror of the Year, volume 12. And it's not scary. It's about a mom 
who just had her third child and she hires a night nurse because she's not getting any help. And it's just about how, you know, those hours when you've had a baby, yeah, and you're just lonely and exhausted and you're like, should I drink wine for breakfast? I don't know, I'm so upset. <laughs> And I have to get kids dressed into preschool when I have a baby. So it's like the, that, that three months that is so, you're so vulnerable is that story. And then the other story is called You Have the Prettiest Mask. And that was published in Lady Churchill's Rosebud Wristlet. And that is about uh, a bunch of tween girls who, um, this was like, I wrote this before the plague but it's about plague masks so it's like uh, it, it's anti-mask but I'm not anti-mask so it's a tough one hmm. but it's about girls who uh when they turn 13 they have to have balls um and then they have to wear masks for the rest of their lives so wow it's a not horror again it's more about social stuff it's a think piece yeah <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Um, amazing. Well, do you have any advice for aspiring authors? Yeah. Um, you know, it's two things. One advice is free. So it's worth what free things are worth. You know, I don't know anyone's particular circumstances and, and everyone really has to find their own way because everyone has their own unique voice. That's one. Number two, I think, uh, if I were to give myself advice that I would never have listened to, because I never took advice when I was younger, it would have been to pay more attention to the market. You know, I've always sort of written whatever I wanted and felt like if I made it good enough that it would be okay. But I think in the, in tr the truth is that, no, you should, you really need to see what's being published. Where is it being published? What agents are representing different things and see how your work fits and think about those things. It's so funny because I interviewed somebody right before you who said the exact opposite. That's so funny. Yeah, like don't pay attention to the market trends. Do what's right for you. So yeah, free advice. <laughs> free advice, that's right, that's right. Um, I still think it's it doesn't matter what the advice is. I just think it it also usually sheds some light on the author, what, what they're recommending, not the advice yes. itself, but it just like all of it, just adds to what you know <laughs> what's going on in your head so which is clearly a lot of really interesting stuff <laughs> <laughs> so yeah <laughs> anyway well Sarah thank you so much thank you for good neighbors I feel like you should um grab have you read Therese and Fowler's A Good Neighborhood no I haven't and I've like I've seen it everywhere Oh my gosh. Well, I feel like the two of your books should be sold together as like a housewarming gift. Because <laughs> it's both like big, bad things basically that happen to communities, but you know, um, and maybe even uh, there's this other book. Oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the name by um, Julie Valerie. Um, anyway, they're all like neighborhoody things. And I feel like they should be packaged in a little box with like, I don't know, some sort of housewarming thing. And uh, Mace. <laughs> Mace. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That would be hilarious. All right. Well, if I know anybody who ever moves, I'm, um, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> oh, actually, somebody wrote The Art of Happy Moving. Now I have a whole thing. Ali Wenski wrote The Art of Happy Moving. Now we have like a three book series. Okay. All right, all I'll right. stop. I'll stop. I'll stop. Okay. Have a great day. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thanks for this great book. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. <laughs> all right. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. Thank you.